Good day, Grade Twelves. Welcome to this next lesson in chemistry. In this lesson, we're going to be carrying on working through chemistry because you guys are writing chemistry on Monday. I hope that your exam today, it was on physics today, hey? Yeah, we well, hope today's physics exam went well. Um, I'm sure it did, um, but as I've said before, what I always used to do as a strategy when I was at school, and yes, it was a very long time ago, but what I used to do was used to think that it didn't matter anymore because that, that exam paper's gone. There's nothing more you can do about it. If it went well, great. If it didn't go well, not great, but that should give you incentive to work even harder for the next exam to make sure that you do even better in the next exam. Okay, so let's see if we can help you with that by going through some more questions. Okay, so the question here says the back Maxwell Boltzmann distribution curve below represents the number of particles. Okay, you know what? I'm actually going to make this a bit bigger. So let's just go over here and make it a bit bigger. Bigger. Okay, there we go. Much better. The maximum Boltzmann distribution curve below shows represents the number of particles against kinetic energy at 300 degrees Celsius. It says redraw this curve in the answer book on the same set of axes. Sketch the curve that will be obtained at a temperature of 400 degrees Celsius. Clearly label the curves 300 degrees and 400. Okay, so I'm not going to redraw. I'm just going to draw on top of this. So what you've got to understand is that at 400 degrees Celsius, what is happening? And what's important and what you really, really guys should all know is that temperature is a measure of your average kinetic energy. Temperature is a measure of your average kinetic energy. So the greater the temperature, the greater the kinetic energy, which means by increasing the temperature to 400 degrees Celsius, it doesn't matter if these particles whether they're in reaction or not, whether these particles are endothermic or not. The point is that increasing the temperature increases the average kinetic energy. So what's going to happen is this curve is going to shift and it's going to shift over to the right because more particles are going to have more kinetic energy. Okay, again, I've got a greater kinetic energy. But what's also important, this is 400 degrees Celsius, is you will notice that the peak of the red graph is lower than the 300 degrees Celsius graph. And the reason for this is due to the fact that you have more particles. You have to have the same number of particles, right? You have to have the same number of particles in the container. It's not like we've suddenly added more particles or decreased the particles. Okay, it's exactly the same number of particles. So for that reason, they are going to be more spread out and more towards the right hand side and therefore the peak is going to be lower. Now it says, using the collision theory, explain how the increase in temperature affects the rate of reaction. Okay, so guys, when we are using the collision theory and we're explaining things like this, there is a phrase that you need to say, and that is effective collisions per unit time and it's either more effective collisions per unit time or fewer collisions effective collisions per unit time if you leave leave out effective you're not going to get the results and if you leave out per unit time you're also going to be marked down this is very 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 important i'm serious about this okay um so let me explain in this case, you would say an increase in temperature and you will not write it like that. I'm just writing it like that because I actually want to finish going through this question sometime today. So an increase in temperature will increase the average kinetic energy of the particles, right? Which in turn will result in a greater chance 
of more effect, more effective collisions per unit time, and therefore an increase in the reaction rate. Do you understand this? This is so important that when I teach this in class, I actually say to the students that I threaten them. I don't ever do this, but I threaten them and I say, I want to be able to phone you at three o'clock in the morning and say to you, why? Using the collision theory, explain why an increase in temperature or an increase in pressure or increase in concentration changes the affects the reaction rate and they need to just mumble in their sleep in their half stupor more effective collisions being a time and then put the phone down they don't even have to remember the next day that i phoned them that's how important this phrase is when it comes to answering these questions okay so please understand that right now let's look at this next question it says 33.6 grams of nitrogen and 24, point, 24 grams of hydrogen are placed in a five decimeter cube sealed container and react according to the following balanced equation using until dynamic equilibrium reached. So it's N2 plus 3H2 goes to 2 NH3 and they've asked you to explain the term dynamic chemical equilibrium. The cool thing about them asking to explain it versus just giving the definition is that you don't have to actually get the words exactly, exactly right. Okay, if you have do a definition, if they say define dynamic chemical equilibria, then you have to get the words exactly right. But if they say explain the term, then all you need to say is that the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Or you could say something along the lines of um, the reaction has reached a point where the forward reaction equals the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. Um, and that's it. Okay. Or you could say that on a macroscopic level, there doesn't seem to be no change, but on a microscopic level, there is still a huge change. Right, now it says at 573 Kelvin, at 573 Kelvin, when the equilibrium is reached, there's 5.6 grams of nitrogen left. Calculate the concentration of both reaction reactants when the concentrate when the reaction reached equilibrium for the first time. Okay, so let's think about this. We've got nitrogen plus hydrogen gives you is in dynamic equilibrium with 2NH3, right? They tell you that you start with 33,6 grams of nitrogen and 24 grams of hydrogen. This is what you started with, but this is in grams, eh? And you ended with, I'm not, and I'm not going to write it down with them, I'm going to write it up here. You ended with 5.6 grams 5,6 grams of nitrogen and they want to know the concentration of both reactions when the re reactants when the reaction reached equilibrium for the first time so now underneath the grams I'm going to do my Shrek start change um, or hang on start reaction let's do it like this start you guys might use different things you might use sumac you, it doesn't matter what you use start reaction equilibrium and concentration and then we need a, this is a table okay now the whole point about this guys is that you cannot 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 use grams versus grams you have to have to use moles so we're going to convert this 33.6 grams and 24 grams into moles similarly with the 5.6 grams so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the 33.6 and change it into moles. Number of moles is equal to mass over the molar mass. The mass of nitrogen by itself is 14, but there are two of them, so it's 28 because it's a diatomic molecule. So therefore, it's 33,6 divided by 28. Okay, so let's go get the calculator out. So that is the mass, which is 33.6 divided by 28 equals 6 over 5 or 1,2 moles. So we started with 1,2 moles. We ended with, so that's 1,2. We ended with 5,6 over 28. Um, 5, mm -mm. 5. 6 divided by 20 
right? Equals one fifth, which is zero comma two. So at equilibrium, we had zero comma two. Okay, we are also given twenty four grams of hydrogen, so that is just going to be twelve moles because we just divided by two. Okay, now that's the number of moles. Now we need to work out the concentration. Concentration is the number of moles at equilibrium divided by the volume, which is five. Okay, so we need to work that out. So do you agree that if we used, if we started with 1.2 moles of nitrogen and ended with 0.2, do you agree we used one mole of nitrogen? Okay, we used one mole. But that means if you look at the ratio of one to three, that means we've used three moles of hydrogen, right? Which means we've now got nine moles of hydrogen left. So at equilibrium, we've got 0.2 divided by 5 is our concentration for the nitrogen, and 9 divided by 5 is the concentration for hydrogen. So that becomes divided by 5, which is 0.04. So that's 0.04 moles per decimeter cubed, right? And this is 9 divided by 5 is going to be 1.9 divided by 5 is going to be 1.8. It's going to be 1.8. 1,8 moles per decimeter cubed. Excellent. So we've done that. Now it says calculate the equilibrium constant when this reaction has reached equilibrium. In order to do that, we actually need to work out the equilibrium concentration of ammonia as well. So we're going to assume that since they didn't say anything about any ammonia and being placed in the sealed container, we started off with zero, yeah. Therefore, if we look at this reaction, it is a ratio of one to two, right? One to two. Therefore, if we use up one year, we're going to gain two there. So we need two moles here. Yeah? So at equilibrium, we're going to have two. This is going to be two over five which is going to be 0,4. Now, your Kc, which is also called the mass expression, is always the concentration of your products over the concentration of reactants. Now, I know that we already know this, but let's just go through it. You cannot have solids and pure liquids in your Kc. It has to be gases or um, aqueous solutions. So let's just check gas, gas, gas. Okay, we sort it. So it's going to be NH3 all to the power of 2 over N2 H2 cubed. Okay, so let's now work that out. This is going to be equal to 0, 0,4 all squared all over, um, this is going to be 0, 0, 0,4 and that is going to be 1,8 cubed. And now we need our calculator. So let's get out the calculator. So we can go, we need a fraction thingy. And we're going to go bracket 0.4, close bracket squared, squared, all over bracket 0, 0, 4, bracket, bracket, 1, comma, 8, bracket, to the power of 3 equals. And that's 500 over 729, which can be written as 0, comma, 6, 9. So that's 0, comma, 6, 9. There we go. Now it said, how would the yield of ammonia change if a smaller container than the five decimeter cubed was, was used? Right, only increase, decrease, or remains the same. Okay, so this is a bit of a sneaky question. And the reason it's a sneaky question is they're not actually asking you about the volume of the container. What they're talking about is actually pressure. Okay, because by doing, by making this container smaller, what you're doing is actually increasing the 
pressure because by decreasing the volume, you're increasing the pressure. So then for that reason, we need to look at the number of moles. We need to look at the number of moles. So there are four moles on this side and two moles on this side. So by decreasing the volume, we're increasing the pressure. We're favoring the side to the right. Okay, favoring the side to the right. And therefore we will get more ammonia out. Okay. Now it says the temperature of this container now increased from 573K to 700K. At this temperature, the equilibrium constant of this reaction decreases. Okay, and they want to know, is this an endothermic or exothermic reaction? Endothermic or exothermic reaction? Well, if you think about it, okay, do you see is that if you decrease Kc, you're getting less ammonia out and more nitrogen and hydrogen. So decreasing the Kc means that the reverse reaction has been favored. So we've increased the temperature, which means we've, and by increasing the temperature, we favored the reverse reaction. So therefore this is an exothermic reaction. The Ford reaction prefers for it to be cold. And I've just explained question 6.5. So the correct answer for this is exothermic. And then it says explain your answer. And I've just explained it. Right. For the record, the reason they do that type of thing where they say, oh, ex and now ex explain it, is because you can get away with getting a 50% chance of getting the answer for that question by just guessing whether it is an endothermic or exothermic. But then to get the extra marks you actually need to be able to correctly identify whether or not it correctly explain why okay so now let's look at this question it says 27 grams of magnesium hydroxide here's the equation is dissolved in two liters okay which is two decimeters cubed at 25 degrees Celsius. A drop of bromothermal blue is added to solution and turns blue. Explain why magnesium hydroxide is considered to be a strong base. It is considered to be a strong base because it dissociates almost completely into magnesium, or actually does dissociate completely, into magnesium and hydroxyl ions. So because it com dissociates completely, and because it dissociates completely into with hydroxyl ions being given off, it is a strong base. Now they want us to calculate the concentration, I mean the pH. Okay, they want us to calculate the pH. So, the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to have to work out the concentration. Do you agree? Oh, sorry, I don't know what's going on here. Let's just close that down. So, um, we pH equals minus the log of the hydrogen plus ions, or 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 you could write H. 3O plus ions. Okay, it's the same thing. Okay, but POH equals minus the log of the concentration of the hydroxide ions. Okay, do you agree with that? And we also know that pH plus POH is equal to 14. So that means that if I work out the POH and then I subtract that from 14, I'll get the pH. And it's a lot easier to work out the pOH than the pH. Okay, but there's a trick to it. Okay, so first what we're going to do is work out the concentration of the 27 grams in the two decimal cube container. Okay, so first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to say concentration is number of moles over volume. So we have to work out the number of moles and number of moles is mass over molar mass. So we're going to find the number of moles of magnesium hydroxide, sorry, which is, well, let's see, the molar mass of magnesium. And remember, guys, I said to you always you should have your formula sheet with you, but magnesium, we're going to say is 24, plus oxygen is 16 and hydrogen is 1 is 17. So we're going to go 2 times 17 
which is 24 plus 34, which is 58. Okay, so the molar mass of magnesium hydroxide is 58 grams per mole. So therefore the concentration is the number of moles, which is 58, over the two decimeter cube container, which is two. So therefore the concentration is going to be 29 um, moles per decimeter cubed. Yes, I'm right. Hang on, no, wait. Um, yes, I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. Okay, now, now, here's the thing. Okay. Um, but here's the thing magnesium hydroxide breaks up into magnesium 2 plus plus 2 hydroxide ions. So that means that the concentration of hydroxide ion is actually double the concentration of the whole magnesium hydroxide, okay? So what you need to realize is that we actually have to take that into account. Um, so we need to take that into account. Yeah, no, I'm right. Sorry, I'm just making sure that a two liters is two decimeters cubed, sorry. I'm in a blonde day. So, as I was saying, the concentration is the number of moles, which we've worked out, divided by the volume, which is two. So the concentration of the whole magnesium hydroxide is 29 moles per decimeter cubed. But for every one um, mole of magnesium hydroxide, we actually have two moles of hydroxides, okay? Which means a concentration of OH minus is actually going to be 2 times 29, which makes, takes it back up to 58. So now we can substitute that into here and get the POH. So we can go POH is equal to minus the log of 58. Okay, so let's go look at what that is. So we're going to go um, clear and we're going to go minus, minus, log of 58 close bracket equals and that's going to be negative 1.76 which is 1.76 so the pH is going to be 1 comma 76 therefore the pH is going to be 14 minus 1 comma 76 which is going to be oh, um, which is going to be plus 14. Okay, it's 12.24. So therefore, the pH is 12,24, which do you agree is showing that it's a very strong base, 12,24. Because the smaller the number, the stronger the acid, and the bigger the number, the stronger the base. Right, excellent. Now, let's just erase this bit and then we can carry on with the rest of the question. Okay, now. It says, it says, HCl with a concentration of 2.5 moles per decimeter cubed, okay, was added to the solution and is shown in the sketch below. Okay, so we've got the magnesium hydroxide plus hydrochloric acid, which gives us magnesium chloride plus water. Fair enough. It says, write down the name of the apparatus P. That is a burette. It says write down the Lowry Bronsted definition of an acid. Lowry Bronsted definition is that an acid is a proton donor. It gives away its hydrogens. 
calculate the minimum volume of H that must be added to the reaction so that it might just change color from blue to yellow. In other words, we are going to use this equation here that says that CA VA over CB VB is equal to NA over NB. Okay, because they are saying we have got 27 grams in your two liters, okay? We have got a drop of bromothamol blue. Okay, quite a lot of water, but anyway. And then they said that we've now got HCl, the concentration of 2.5 moles is added, and they want to know what volume of this HCl has to be added. But we've got the mole ratio here, it's one to two. So we can work this out. We've got the concentration of the acid, it is 2,8. We want the volume of the acid that will make this just neutralize. The concentration of the base we worked out to be 29. The volume of the base is two decimeters cubed. The number of moles of the acid is 2 over the number of the moles of the base, which is 1. Okay, so now we're sol solving for VA, the volume of the acid, right? So we're going to go 2,8 VA is equal to 4 times by 29. I'm just cross multiplying. And I'm dividing both sides by 2,8. And let's work out that what that gives us. So it's going to be 4 times 29 divide, oopsie, delete, divided by 2.8 equals 41.4 decimeters cubed. 41,4 decimeters cubed. Sure. It says, what would happen to the color solution if 20 cubic centimeters of water is added after the HCl was added and the solution turned yellow? Um, it said, what would happen to the color solution if 20 cubic centimeters was added after HCl was added and the solution turned yellow? Oh, they want to know if it's going to stay yellow or if it's going to change the same thing, change to blue. Okay, so if we're adding water, do you see that we're adding water here? Okay, um, but you'll notice that this is not a reversible reaction. It is a one-way reaction. So adding water is not going to change anything to the reaction. It's going to remain yellow. Right, now. It says a galvanic cell contains an aluminium electrode and a platinum electrode, okay? And it says that in a cobalt solution, it's interesting. Okay, now, galvanic cell contains an aluminium electrode and a platinum remit. Okay, so we've got aluminium electrode, aluminium, and you've got a platinum electrode, and there's a cobalt solution, cobalt, cobalt solution. The cell operates under standard conditions, and this is a galvanic cell, okay, which means it's making power, so there's a nice little voltmeter going on over here. Okay, right, now, the half reaction that occurs in the platinum uh, at the platinum electrode in the cobalt half cell is given as follows. Okay, so they're making it into yeah, that makes more sense because it has to be a salt bridge. Okay, let me just redraw. Um, erase link. So we've got makes more sense. Aluminium contains them and a platinum electrode in a cobalt solution. Okay, wait, only the platinum, that's what I was getting confused with, only the platinum electrode is in the cobalt solution, it looks like, okay. Um, not necessarily, okay. And they say, and we've got a voltmeter, and we have a salt bridge, okay. 
And its cell says now, the half reaction that occurs in a platinum electrode in the cobalt half cell is this. CO3 plus plus electron gives you CO2 or 2 plus. It says that which electrode are electrons released to the external circuit? Write down only platinum or aluminium. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Um, oh dear, I didn't mean to do that. We need to have a look at our redox table. Okay, now that's pretty small, um, but there's not much I can do about it. We need the platinum aluminium. Okay, here is aluminium, uh, three plus, plus three electrons, and it is at minus one comma six six. Okay, then, Let's see what else you got here. It must be platinum. Yeah, is platinum. Platinum two plus plus two electrons, and that goes to PT, and that's plus one twenty or one comma two. And then they've got cobalt, which they've told us. Okay, cobalt is at the bottom here. CO three plus plus an. Oh, my just check this plus sorry plus an electron goes to CO two plus plus one comma eight one. Okay, and what do they want to know? They want to know which electro electrons are released to the external circuit. In other words, they want to know in which one is you've got oil rig. Okay, and oxidation is the loss of electrons. So they want to know in which of these are the electrons being lost to the circuit. Okay, right. So if you look at this, do you see that this is increasing, reducing abilities that way? Which means that these are the oxidizing, sorry, these are reducing agents, which means that they are being oxidized. Okay. And these are the oxidizing agents and they are being reduced. These are the oxidizing agents and they are being reduced. Now, electrons are given off at oxidation. Okay, during oxidation. So, therefore, I would say, sorry, it goes to aluminium, that the reaction works Um, hang on, this way. The aluminium is being oxidized, okay, and then the platinum is being reduced. The platinum is being reduced. Let me just check. It says the half fraction occurs and the platinum electrode is given. Okay, so I would say that the aluminium is where the oxidizer aluminium, which is the oxidation half reaction. So therefore it's going to be aluminium goes to aluminium goes to aluminium three plus plus three electrons. Okay. It says the formula of the oxidizing agent in this reaction. The formula of the oxidizing agent is going to be in this case, it's going to be platinum. So therefore, it is going to be PT. How does the mass of the anode change during this reaction, right? It only increases, decreases, or remains the same. Okay, so if you think about this, we know that there is oxa and red cat, okay? And oxidation is occurring at the anode. So therefore, the oxidation is occurring at the aluminium. I'm assuming that there's cobalt in this one as well. Okay, so if that's the case, normally what happens is the electrons are given off. Okay, and then the cobalt, okay, normally the electrons are given off, right? And then this becomes, so 
what should happen is because oxidation is occurring at the anode, the mass of the anode should decrease, okay, because it has been eaten up. It says write down the standard self notation for this. So it'd be aluminium goes to aluminium 3 plus, and then it is platinum 2 plus. Platinum 2 plus going to platinum. And remember, you always have to write one mole per decimeter cubed. And then one mole per decimeter cubed to show that it is at standard concentration. The aluminum electrode is now replaced by a zinc electrode. Okay. The aluminum electrode is now replaced by a zinc electrode. So here is a zinc electrode over there, which is Zn2 plus plus two electrons goes to zinc, Zn, and it's minus 0, 0,76. And it says, calculate the initial cell potential in new cell when it operates. Okay, so now it is going from platinum to 0.76. So it's going to be 1 comma 2 minus minus 0 comma 76, which is going to be 1 comma 96 volts. There you go. Okay, so that was the whole of that question. It's a nice question. They just should have been more specific about the cobalt. Okay, now it says a solution of sodium chloride in water. Um, so it's NaCl plus water is used as an electrolyte in the electrolytic cell as it's set up here. So you've got two carbon electrodes. We've got gas S and gas R. We've got sodium chloride, which is brine, and we've got carbon electrodes. And it says the net cell reaction for this occurs. You've got sodium chloride and you've got water and there's sodium hydroxide, hydrogen and chlorine. First of all, they say define the term electrolysis. And the most important thing that you need to define when you're defining electrolysis is that electrolysis occurs due through to the transfer of electricity due to free ions. If you don't include the phrase free ions when you're talking about the transfer of electricity, you're going to get it wrong. Because the only way that electrolysis works is through the use of free ions. Right, now... It says identify gas S and gas R. Okay, so do you agree this is the positive electrode and this is the negative electrode? So obviously one of these is getting hydrogen gas and the other one is getting chlorine gas. Okay, um, but if you think about it, you've got 2Cl minus, which has to give away two electrons to become Cl2 plus 2 electrons. So it has to give away its electrons. The only way it can give, it to, give away its electrons if it is happening at the positive electrode. So this here is chlorine gas. Hydrogen is a positive ion, so it has to gain electrons from the electrode. So therefore, this is hydrogen gas. It says, explain why sodium metal does not form during the electrolysis of sodium chloride. Um, the only reason it doesn't is because um, of the reducing ability and oxidizing ability of the different um, things. So what I would say to you is that the way you would say this is that the reason sodium metal does not form electrolysis is because the fact is that the others have got higher oxidizing age abilities. Right, now it says initially 0.5 moles of sodium chloride, decimeters cubed, of sodium chloride electrolyte with concentration 2.5 moles is used. How many moles of electrolyte will be left after 2.24 decimeters cubed of chlorine formed at SCP. Okay, so we've got 2 NaCl plus 2 H2O goes to 2 NaOH plus H2 plus Cl2. What are they saying? They said initially we've got 0 0.5 at a concentration of 2.5. How many moles of the electrolyte will be left after 2.24 decimeters cubed contain. Okay, so all you need to do is work out 
the mole ratio is 2 to 1. Since we formed 2.2, you have to work out the number of moles here. So you work out the number of moles here. Then you work out the mole ratio. You see what the difference is, and that'll tell you how many moles are left. Unfortunately, we've run out of time now, grade 12s. But I trust that you will study hard and do really well. I would really like to urge you to go through the old question papers on the, um, on the system and also through the videos where I've gone through those old papers. Have a great day.